Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hopefully online people can see me and hear me okay. Quick message in the chat if everything's good. Um, how's everyone doing? Perfect. Great. We're going to be starting a new unit today on air pollution continued. So it's air pollution part two. And this, I guess, topic is going to focus on ozone and a class of molecules called CFCs, which are doing their, hard, doing their hardest work to destroy our ozone. Um, sometimes ozone's good, sometimes it's bad. We're going to talk about when and where that might be the case. Uh, one piece of business before we get started, just a note that last class, which was Tuesday, we completed the previous unit, which means the unit assignment for that unit becomes due next Tuesday. So I changed the due date for that and it'll expire. So please make sure if you haven't done it already, please do it ASAP. It shouldn't take that long. Uh, and I do recommend that you just do it while following along. That said, we do have a new one that's just live today. So it will be covering this new unit. Um, anybody here on already? See the new unit assignment? Got in okay? It's working great, perfect. All right, so I think we're, we're ready to go. Thank you online people for um, letting me know. Things are good. Uh, okay, so our first thing we're gonna be talking about is this molecule, ozone. Ozone is a molecule composed of three atoms of oxygen. It's got the structure O3. And there's a picture of it here. You can see there's kind of three blue atoms sandwiched together. And these are held together by covalent bonds. And we talked about covalent bonds in the previous unit. Um, they don't form a straight line, they kind of are kinked, they form an angle uh, of about 116 and a half degrees, um, kind, of, kind of make an angle like that if you looked at the centers of each of the three atoms. And we would call ozone an allotrope 
of oxygen. And what we mean by allotrope is, is it's a form of a pure element that's different from some other form of a pure element. So many elements can come in multiple different forms, and we call them all allotropes. They're all still pure elements, but they have different sort of bonding or different chemical structures. Uh, a great example is carbon. So carbon comes in the form of charcoal, or it comes in the form of graphite, or it comes in the form of diamond. And they're all just pure carbon, but the bonding is a little bit different in each of them, and we would call all of these allotropes of each other. Perfect, so ozone is a thing. Um, what word describes different chemical elements, may as well get started right away, of the same pure elements such as diamond and graphite, which are two different chemical forms of carbon. Allotropes, isomers, homologs, or elements. So yeah, this one should be straightforward at this point in the course. Start off with a bang. So is ozone a good thing or a bad thing? And the answer to that question is actually both. It's both good and bad, depending on where we come into contact. We, we kind of mentioned ozone a little bit in our previous lecture, where we said that smog, which was formed from NO2 gas, that orange, remember that orange NO2 gas, it can react with sunlight and the air and produce ozone. And I talked about how that could be a really bad thing for you. You don't want to be breathing that, particularly if you've got respiratory problems or lung issues or whatever. You want to stay inside if it's really smoggy out during the sunniest parts of the day. Um, and that's true. So this is a, a map here showing you know, altitude from the surface of the earth where the troposphere kind of is this, you know, this um, around 10 mile or 15 kilometer stretch. And you can see if you look at ozone levels, it's pretty low. So, so the closer it is to the left margin here, the lower the ozone concentration. But once you kind of get into the stratosphere, you see this big spike that the percentage of ozone drastically increases in that part. It's still like, you know, not a major component of the atmosphere. Like it's still present in very small amounts, but it's present in a lot larger amounts there than it does sort of in any other layer of the atmosphere. So we call that the ozone layer. And it's well up out of the troposphere into the stratosphere where, you know, nothing is really alive. So an, even though ozone is harmful and damaging and oxidizing, for organic material like us, it's really not a consequence for us when it's up that high. However, notice when you get close to the ground, there's this little peak right down at the bottom, closest surface to the ground. And this is ozone we call either tropospheric ozone because it's in the troposphere, or we call it ground level ozone. Hopefully for obvious reasons, it's at ground level. And this is from pollution. It's formed due to pollution that we talked about in our previous class. Things like VOCs can cause it, and NO2 gas, nitrogen oxide gases that are produced when you burn things in engines, burn nitrogen in engines. Ozone is actually, like, it's a useful molecule. We use this, if you buy bottled water and you look at the ingredients in bottled water, um, what you can see, the ingredient says demineralized treated water and ozone. So ozone is used as a product or, or an ingredient in your water. So if you buy a bottle of this, there actually is no ozone in it. And what they do is they take the bottle, they fill it with water, which might have microorganisms in it, bacteria, whatever. Uh, and then they like purge the solution, like they bubble in a whole bunch of ozone gas and then seal the top off really quick. And what happens is that ozone is very toxic, damaging to biological entities. And so all of those little particles, all those little things that could be present in the water are killed and it sterilizes the water. And because the cap is sealed, no new things can get in. And so this is how they make sure that bottled water is sterile when you open it and then you wanna drink it later on. Now, ozone actually is quite reactive and actually left on its own, it'll decompose over, I don't know, from hours to days, probably a few days, it'd be almost all gone. So there's ozone in the bottle when they close it and put it on a truck and ship it, 
But by the time you buy it and drink it, the ozone has all decomposed. So there's actually no ozone in the bottle that you buy, but there was ozone that was put in there. And when it decomposes, it turns back into oxygen gas. And oxygen gas is just a regular part of our atmosphere. So it's, it's, it's useful for us for things like that. Um, we have a unit on water, hopefully we get to it later on. But I talked there about why we don't use the same method for drinking water. Like if, in your tap, we use chlorine instead. And uh, so here's a guy, he says the top benefits of ozonated o olive oil. So ozonation is also a chemical process that we use in organic chemistry. If you've taken organic chemistry, you may have seen this reaction, ozon ozonolysis before. Um, and it'll react with things like carbon-carbon double bonds. And olive oil is full of carbon-carbon double bonds. So if you treat um, olive oil with ozone, you end up getting this sort of creamy, um, almost like a paste, you know what I mean? Like kind of like a, a thick kind of cream. And people will make it and then sell it as like a natural skin cream, like a remedy like this. And this is one of the places that's selling it. You can see there's ads on the side. Uh, and the reason why you should buy it is a long list like this. Stimulation for growth cells, blah, 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 blah. Treating sunburn, insect bites, ringworm, cuts and burns, blah, blah, blah. Anything bad that can kind of happen to your skin is listed as something that this will cure. So just remember, when you see lists like this out in the wild, just remember that this is on our red flag list, right? That if an ad claims to cure everything under the sun, probably too good to be true. Uh, one thing that they actually do here is claim that this is, use ozone injection, they bubble ozone through. It's written here somewhere. They call it powerful natural remedy. By definition, this is not a natural remedy. Because natural, remember we defined it? Natural meant that none of the chemical steps used to produce it can happen outside of an organism. So if this was like, you know, <laughs> exuded from sheep or extracted from whatever, you know, then it could be considered natural. But this is very obviously a product that was manipulated chemically deliberately by human beings. So it's by definition, an artificial product. All right, ozone therapy is another thing you may have seen or heard of before. Um, I, ha I know somebody who was into this. Basically what you do is you buy these like uh, chambers and it's kind of rubberized around the edges and you get inside and the door shuts and it's supposed to seal kind of around your neck and then your head sticks out the top and you sit in there for like half an hour or something like that. And then what happens is it kind of like injects into the air inside around you, uh, ozone gas and usually like steam as well. So it's kind of like a sauna for your whole body except for your head. And it's sold as a detox thing. And you know, we already talked about detox. So you don't need detox, you know, if your doctor tells you there's, you're poisoned and you need, that's different. But I mean like, generally speaking, the average person, this isn't a necessary type of thing. But what happens is the ozone will react with oils, natural oils that are present in your skin and it turns them brown. And so when you get up out of this thing, you're sweating too, right? Cause it's hot and it all kind of comes off. It looks nice and white inside. When you get out, there's all this gonna be brown gunk all on the inside of it. And that's how they sell it as a detox method because they're saying all that brown stuff is all the toxins that this removed from you. And it's a very powerful sales pitch. Um, it's not, it's just your natural oils that have been oxidized by the ozone. So don't get one of these. Ozone, I think I mentioned before, is bad for your lungs. And does anyone recognize this movie still, what it's from? Yeah. It's uh, Inglorious Bastards by Quentin Tarantino. And there was a problem that people used to get that uh, worked in movie theaters. And it was a problem that was called projectionist lung. 
And so people that were working in movie theaters, typically what they would do is there were these small booths, the projection booths, where you'd have these cameras, uh, I guess they weren't cameras, they were projectors, that would have like reels of film that would run, and then it had this strobe light where the strobe was perfectly lined up with the um, um, moving rate, I guess spin rate of the wheel with the film on it, and it would project it out onto a screen and it would look like, you know, the movie was playing. And this required a lot of maintenance and a lot of work and it was very technical and it's not like today where you could kind of just go and press play on a projector and it just, and just sit there. Um, but they would spend hours and hours and hours every day in these little booths and these cameras, the light was so bright that that light would interact with the air and produce ozone gas. So if you walked in there, ozone gas is something you, you can actually smell. And you may have smelled ozone. It kind of smells actually not that bad. To me, it smells like really clean. Um, it's the sort of smell you would get if you had something electronic that like shorted out. Or it also kind of smells like if you're in a small room and like a photocopier had just printed off like 100 copies in that room, and then you walk in, you kind of smell that inky kind of a, you know what I mean? Anybody? Anyway, that's kind of like what ozone smells like. But anyway, people that were working in theaters for years and years would develop chronic lung problems as a result of breathing in relatively low amounts of ozone, but sort of constantly over many years. So ozone is not something you want to breathe in, especially if you've got already certain respiratory issues. So this ground level ozone is a real problem. And it's a consequence of things like NO2 gas and VOCs that we're putting out into the environment. So how do these pollutants make ozone? Well, we know there's a light dependence. This is a map, an aerial map of California. And it's showing ozone levels throughout the day. And notice at 6 a.m., the sun first comes out, there's really no ozone anywhere. After a few hours, you know, some patches start to form, there's some other places, it starts to develop more and more. And by late afternoon, by 4 p.m., there's basically ozone all up and down the full length of the state. Then nighttime happens, sun goes down, and notice six hours later, basically all the ozone is gone. So this ozone, this ground level ozone problem, it's very much a temporary problem. And that ozone is generated on site, on the spot, by the interaction of sunlight with pollutants. And then once the sun goes down, because ozone is reactive and it, it decomposes all on its own, it's pretty well gone before, by the next morning. So it's a cyclical thing and it comes and it goes, it's weather dependent. And uh, obviously, like if it's windy, that'll kind of blow the air away and there's pressure air and things like that. Um, these are levels in kind of eastern Canada, northeastern United States. And <laughs> notice where we are. We are, I guess we're more over here, right? But anyway, Nova Scotia is clean. We have basically no ozone problems here. That's because we also have no smog, and VOCs really aren't much of an issue here either. Uh, when you go into the very heavily industrialized areas, you see levels go up a lot higher. It, it scales with population and uh, industrial activity because that's what produces these pollutants, which give rise to the, to the ozone in the air. So what actually goes on is NO2, that orange gas, remember, that comes out of car engines, uh, can absorb sunlight. And if it's colored, it's definitely absorbing visible light. And that causes one of the oxygens to break off of the NO2. So the NO2 just becomes NO and then a separate oxygen atom all by itself. Then what happens is that separate oxygen atom can accidentally collide with an O2 and that turns it into an O3. So the mechanism here is, is pretty simple. It can go backwards in reverse. Uh, two ozones can react to make three oxygens. Like there's a lot of kind of complex possible reactions that can take place. But this is an important way that 
nitrogen oxide gases basically convert themselves into ozone when there's a light source like the sun present. So these are the ones that are the biggest issues. So you can see this. They're saying the pollutants bake together in sunlight. Well, they don't bake together. They, there's, a, there's a very well known and very well understood reaction which takes place, photochemical reaction. All right, so that's the big issue down here, right? It's bad for us down here. Um, but, you know, it, it's like anything else. It, it varies with region. It varies with time of year and all these sorts of things. Um, but living in Nova Scotia, it's essentially a non-issue. Other parts of the country, maybe not so much, or other parts of the world. But we have this other big one up here, right? This ozone layer. And this is something that, again, used to be, I would say, like the number one environmental issue of the time. Remember how we talked about uh, acid rain? And we said acid rain was like the biggest issue in like the 80s or something. Um, the ozone layer basically was another huge issue that was kind of a thing around the same time and is now something you barely hear about, which is a good thing. We fixed it. Remember the three things I talked about, the three things that are necessary to fix an environmental problem? Someone to identify what the problem is and the extent of the problem. Number two, someone to come up with a solution, right, a technological solution often on alternatives or cleaning methods or something to prevent the problem. And then number three, political will to force people to use that solution. So if you look at where we are with global warming, you know, we've identified the problem pretty well. Um, the solutions part are in progress, I guess I would say. You know, there's alternative energy solutions, but it's not something they can just instant re re instantly replace fossil fuels. Um, and the political will is probably the slowest of the, of the triad there. But we'll get there. I'm confident. I'm optimistic. 6.2, ozone can be present in different layers of the atmosphere. In what layer is it most likely to pose a risk to our health? And the answer is the troposphere, because that's where we are. That's where we live. That's what we breathe. In what atmospheric layer can the ozone layer be found? That's up higher. That's in the stratosphere. Okay. The reason it's up there, by the way, how that ozone forms is there's energy from the sun that get, can penetrate only so far into the atmosphere before it gets absorbed. And it absorbs, uh, oxygen atoms absorb it, and they turn themselves into ozone as a result. So ozone um, in the stratosphere is super valuable to us because it's really good at absorbing certain wavelengths of light. And these are wavelengths of light that are produced by the sun that come to Earth and would basically cook us alive if it wasn't for our ozone layer. So just a, a very brief thing on, on light, first of all. Um, light exists as waves, so they're kind of wave phenomena, and a wave is like a wave on the water where you have crests and, and troughs, we call them, the, the maxes and mins, and it oscillates up and down as it goes. And we can define a wave by a number of factors, one of them being the wavelength, which is the distance between two peaks or the distance between two troughs, same thing. So the top wave, the red one, would be one with a longer wavelength than the one below. It's got a shorter wavelength. The shorter the wavelength of the light, the more energy it has, the more energetic, the more energy is packed into each particle of light where a particle of light is called a photon. Okay, so the lights you see in here, they're all producing visible light, and there's, you know, untold billions of photons being produced by each light source, and they're all kind of coming down and bouncing off us, you know, and all filling the room with these sorts of little particles. Now, light can actually have huge, hugely variable wavelength ranges. And really, really long waves, like radio waves, are like, can be tens of meters long. So when you're driving in a car and you get the radio on, 
Um, there's radio waves that are obviously being detected by your vehicle that, you know, they're on the order of meters. Those are actually in our room right now, passing through. They can pass right through the walls. So if you turned on a radio, you can get reception in here as well. Then as you go shorter wavelength to higher energy, you're going to microwave. And microwave is actually really low energy as well. Microwave, uh, people think it's really high energy because you can like, cook your food in a microwave oven. But what microwaves do is just cause water molecules to rotate in your food. And as they rotate, they give off heat and it warms up your food that way. Um, it's not very strong though. It's not strong enough to like cause chemical reactions or break bonds or do anything like that. Then we got infrared. Then we got the visible region. And the visible region is a very kind of narrow region of wavelengths that go from about 400 nanometers to 800 or 700 or 800. Where on the long wavelength side we have red, and then you kind of go right through the rainbow, where on the short wavelength side you've got kind of blue and violet. Higher energy than visible is ultraviolet, UV. Then we're getting into like X rays and gamma rays, which are really high energy and really damaging to biological tissues. Uh, so if you are exposed to UV light from the sun, it can cause skin damage for sure, it causes aging, it causes sunburn. Over the long term, it can increase your chances of developing skin cancer. Visible light is less energetic, and so visible light is kind of less of an issue. And then when you get to the other ones, infrared, microwave, radio, essentially no effect on our health. 5G, by the way, like 5G towers that use um, basically light, electromagnetic radiation uh, for signals. They're out somewhere in like this region. Um, a lot of people are worried about possible health effects of 5G, but the energy is just so low for each photon of energy that in my mind at least, there's no possible way it could interact with matter in our bodies in a negative way. You know, it's way, way lower energy than like visible light. And that's not even dangerous. It's the UV light where it starts to become harmful for us. So the sun puts out all kinds of different wavelengths of light. And this is a solar spectrum. So it shows what wavelengths of light the sun emits. Fully 53% of the energy from the sun coming to earth comes in the form of infrared light. And this is light that we are not able to see with our eyes, but when it, we're, we absorb it, it, uh, it causes us to feel warmer. So an example here is if you are trying to, let's, does anyone here like raise chickens or ducks? You know, like you must have seen it though, where they have like this sort of like cage or pen, and then there's like little ducklings running around, and there's this like red light that's like hanging. And that's a, an infrared light. Like there's very little actual visible light that comes off of it, but a lot of infrared. So if you put your hand under it, it feels warm. And so for like the chicks or the ducklings, they can sit under the light and get warm. These lights, by the way, were kind of a fad. I don't know when, like the 60s or the 70s for people to have them in their bathrooms. Um, I know like I, I've been in lots of apartments that were old apartments that in the bathroom that had this like infrared light installed. And I think the idea is like if you flicked it on and had a shower and then you step, you know that like terrible feeling when you step out of a shower and you're like, you're freezing. You could step under this like heat lamp thing and then you wouldn't feel cold. I've never seen one in a modern build, but I, I don't think they're a bad idea. I mean, you could probably still have them. 39% uh, of the energy from the sun that comes to Earth is in the visible range. These are the colors. See what makes us be able to see, you know, the, the blue to red. And about 8%, which is a small but significant percentage of the light from the sun, is in the ultraviolet range. And we can't see ultraviolet light, right? We, it's, it's invisible to us, but 8% coming from the sun, if we sit out in it long, we know it's there. And especially like depending on uh, how dark your skin is, you may have very easily developed skin uh, sunburn uh, or you know, if you're wearing sunscreen or whatever. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so even though we can't see UV light, 
we can detect its presence in a lot of different ways. This is a, a, a kind of a nice picture. This is um, just different minerals, naturally occurring minerals, that if you turn all the lights out and turn on a UV lamp, what you can see for all of these things is they start to glow in different colors. So this is a process called fluorescence, which is when there's a substance that can absorb light that's invisible and then emit light, re-emit new colors of light at, uh, at um, different wavelengths that are visible. And so you can see this happening right here. Uh, you probably have seen this yourself if you've ever, like you see it in bars a lot. Now, I know the bar scene has been kind of muted the last couple of years with COVID. Um, I remember like in New Minus, there used to be a bowling alley that would have glow bowling. So you may have experienced that before. But it's basically like there's all these UV lights all over the place that you can't see with your eyes. Or if you look at them, there might be like a faint kind of purplish glow. But you can't see the majority of the light coming out. Um, but all kinds of other things can absorb that light and then re-emit it at a different color. So if you're wearing sneakers and there's like, you have white laces, sometimes the laces will just sort of pop. You know what I mean? They're like they're really, really bright. Uh, your shirt, if you had a white shirt, really shows up brightly. Um, you can actually get tattoos that are ultraviolet tattoos, like this guy here, and there's one like here too, that uh, the one on the left, if there's no UV light, you can't actually see anything. So it just looks like he has no tattoo at all, but then if you turn on a black light, it kind of glows as if it was the skeleton underneath. Um, I showed this one year in this class, and somebody came up to me after class, they had worked the summer in a tattoo place, and they asked me to pass on this message to you, don't get a UV tattoo. And the reason is, is they're like, they're cool and they look great, but after like two or three years, oh, it's telling me my pencil's low, I don't care. Um, after like um, a few years, they start to go yellow. You get this kind of gross yellow looking thing. The, the, the UV inks, I, I just think they're not that great yet. All right, I wanna show you, I, I brought a couple of chemicals today. I thought it's fun to be able to do something, um, something else. So what I'm gonna do is just switch, switch my camera over here to our trusty spot over here. And I wonder if there's an easy way to turn off, yeah, there is. Easy way to turn off the screen. And I'm gonna turn off the lights too. Oh, perfect, we're just left with a little bit of light here. All right, so I have here a UV lamp, which you probably can't see very well here at all, but what I'm gonna do is plug it in And this is a little handheld thing, and you can see, like, if I shine it at you guys, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very dim, you know, from this perspective. And I don't know if you can see that online. Just, yeah, it looks like it's a similar kind of light that you would see at uh, the bowling alley or a bar or something like that. And what I'm going to do is just set this down on the table upside down. and. That's the problem. It's, uh, I gotta hold it, I think. So you can see here, this is just a container of water and you can't really see anything happening quite yet. And I'm going to pour in a chemical called rhodamine. You can see it actually glowing just a little bit here. So you can see that that substance actually glow, glows quite brightly. It's absorbing the ultraviolet light that we can't see out of this, and it's re-emitting light that's kind of reddish um, pink, I guess you would say. This dye, by the way, is used very commonly in like what, what are called tracer studies. So this is like has almost no negative effects on the environment. So what they'll do is they'll like pour a bunch of this stuff into a lake or a river 
and then watch to see what the flow rate is of the river, how long it takes that sort of plume of colored stuff to get to the bottom and, and this sort of thing. All right, I'm going to try one more. And I would love it if I could prop that up somehow. Just one sec. I've got this thing. Now hopefully this doesn't fall and soak my stuff here. That's, that looks good. Maybe. All right. People see that okay? So, yeah, it looks pretty cool in the video too. It, you can't see much yet. I haven't put the chemical in yet. So this chemical is called fluorescein, and it's named like that because it is very a very fluorescent molecule. And I'm going to take a little scoop of it. And then drop it in. It's funny, this camera here is not doing it justice at all. It actually looks really cool. Hmm. Let's see if I can get a better, better view for the online people. This looks like a big white. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no better. But hopefully for everyone else, this actually looks you know, you can see that material as it slowly kind of works its way down, getting closer and closer to the bottom here. Maybe if I, oh, I think I can make this better. I just need to put the lamp further away. It's not so bright. There we go, look at that. So that's it, you can kind of see this material and if you swirl the liquid a little bit, starts to fill the entire thing. You can see the stuff on the bottom and you get this like very kind of bright green solution here. And this is actually the same chemical that they use in Mr. Clean or, you know, pine salt or things like that to make it look that really, really bright color. All right. We had fun with that. Let's put the lights back on. And let's get the projector back on. Great. I'm here, projector's here, we're all here. Without the black light, these solutions look, you know, <laughs> just like a Kool-Aid, like some kind of colored thing. Now, a lot of manufacturers, like a lot of different, that make different products, like to take fluorescent materials and add them to things like laundry detergent and things like that. Um, if you do go glow bowling, or go to a bar and you're wearing a white shirt and it glows really bright. The reason it glows really bright is manufacturers of the, the laundry detergent put white fluorescent material in there. And the reason is, is if you're out in the sun or you're out in a light, it actually, your clothes are emitting small amounts of light and it makes them look brighter, which makes them look cleaner. And it's really obvious if you're somewhere that has a UV source. Someone said, is there not potential for 5G to impact us on an electromagnetic level? Um, no, I don't think so. Like, I think it's just light and it goes right through us. Uh, there's, there's no interaction with any parts of our body. We don't absorb it. It doesn't interact with us. So, you know, if, if you are, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about it. I just, uh, I've never heard a convincing mechanism for how it could possibly cause us any damage. Okay, we're good. UVA then. So UV is the light that's coming from this lamp and the light that's coming from this lamp is actually um, UVA light. 
And so the ultraviolet light coming from the sun is often broken up into sort of three main different se segments, UVA, UVB, and UVC. And UVA is the part of the UV spectrum that's closest to visible in energy. And as you go to B, it becomes more energetic, more damaging. And then when you go to C, it's the most energetic and most damaging. So UVC is not something we really have to worry about because the ozone layer absorbs 100% of it. So none of that actually reaches the surface of the Earth. The UVB is quite energetic. It's probably the, the part of the UV spectrum which causes us the most damage because it can lead to sunburn, it can lead, it's, a, it's linked to sun cancer, and our ozone layer only blocks out some of it. It blocks out a lot of it, but only some. And then UVA basically just comes straight through. The ozone layer doesn't protect us against UVA, uh, so we still are exposed to that. Although UVA is the least damaging of the three, so that's, that's good if that has to happen. Um, UVC is actually sometimes used. Oh, sorry, yes. Good question. So what is sunblock doing uh, when it comes to these different wavelengths? I actually have slides coming up on what sunscreen is and how it works. Uh, effectively, a very quick and easy answer to your question is um, it just absorbs the light before it reaches your skin. And it not only has to absorb the light, it has to dump that energy in a safe way. And so molecules are designed to do that specifically. Um, so UVC is this really high energy light that the ozone layer blocks. We can buy lamps that produce UVC light and they're called germicidal lamps sometimes. And these, are off, these can be used to like purify drinking water. Uh, what they'll do is they'll kill microorganisms that are in the water because you know, this is very high energy light and it'll destroy cells, kill things. So um, the person in the picture here is Dr. Jenny Rand who is a professor here at Acadia in the engineering department, and some of her research work involves um, cleaning drinking water with various different methods. So this is a graph here. It's kind of showing, you know, where in the spectrum uh, how much of the light actually gets through. So basically, this is like how much is blocked up here. So UVB is like kind of like 90% blocked by the sun, and Basically, none of the UVA gets blocked. It all just goes straight through. So thanks to the ozone layer for protecting us from the most dangerous wavelengths of sunlight. Uh, we talked about the vacuum UV as well, the extreme UV. It's past UVC. This doesn't get far into our atmosphere at all, so we don't have to worry about extreme UV. Uh, so how does ozone form? Well, this extreme UV, this is where the ozone layer forms in the first place, this extreme UV gets uh, absorbed by oxygen in the atmosphere, and it doesn't happen until really you get to the stratosphere, because that's where you have, start to see significant um, air pressures, like amounts of air. It's too thin, higher than that. And what happens is the extreme UV gets absorbed by O2, breaks it into two oxygen atoms. Two oxygen atoms, like an O2 can react with an O to make an ozone. So this is sort of constantly being produced in the stratosphere by sunlight, and it's also constantly then decomposing. So there's this what we call an equilibrium, this constant formation of ozone and constant destruction of ozone through natural decay. And it leads to this what we call steady state concentration of ozone that's present in the atmosphere at all times. Um, which is fine. I remember as a kid, I'd hear on the news about you know, ozone depletion being an environmental issue. And I thought, well, why don't they just make a bunch of ozone and put it up there? And, well, you can't do that. First of all, the amount of ozone you'd have to put up there would be insane. Second, you'd solve the problem for one day, and then it would decompose, and you'd be back to where you were the next day. Yes? So it actually does. So it, it's... It's always decomposing, but it's also, also always forming. 
right? And we're going to look at this in more detail in the coming slides. And in particular, in certain parts of the world, um, this is a bigger challenge than others. Because near the poles, we have parts of the year where there's basically no sunlight or very little sunlight for, you know, months. And we're going to look in particular at what happens at the South Pole when this happens. So as long as the sun comes up the next day, our ozone layer grows back <laughs> and we're good. All right, another few, few more questions. What energy range of UV light is not significantly absorbed by the ozone layer? UVA, UVB, UVC, or vacuum UV? The correct answer is UVA. It's the one that gets through. So why do we care about all this UV light? What, you know, why do we care if the ozone layer disappears and we get a little bit more UV light coming to the surface of the Earth? Um, one of the issues is, this is returning back, by the way. Uh, I took this from like a, a GMO place. <laughs> um, remember back when we looked at the IARC, which is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, talking about hazards versus risk. We talked about different um, categories of, of risk or hazard rating for different types of activities. Category one are known carcinogens. Definitely carcinogens. Sunlight is on there, okay? Some chemicals are on there. We got things like smoking, tobacco, alcohol is on there, certain types of air pollution, um, particulate matter, and things like wood dust is particulate matter, smoke, um, certain chemicals like benzene and uh, aromatic amines and things like that. Then we have category 2A, which is probably carcinogenic. Glyphosate made that list. We talked about glyphosate earlier. Uh, high temperature frying, so eating fried foods. It's on that list. Working night shifts, working as a barber or hairdresser. Um, so all sorts of things that doesn't mean you get cancer if you do these things. It just means if you do these things regularly, that group of people has been shown to have an elevated risk for certain types of cancer. Might be a minor elevated risk, but it's still measurable. So UV causes cancer. Um, this is an interesting paper. It was published in the British um, Medical Journal, BMJ. It says, indoor tanning and non-melanoma skin cancer, systematic review and meta-analysis. So, Tanning is a very common activity for a lot of people. And um, I'll show you some stats in a minute, but these stats are kind of old. I don't know if indoor tanning is something that kind of comes in and out of fashion, but maybe, maybe it's out of fashion now, I don't know. But it's saying indoor tanning is associated with significant increased risk of basal and squamous skin cell, uh, cell skin cancer. Risk is higher with use in early life, less than 25 years old which is almost everyone in the class, um, may account for hundreds of thousands of cases of non-melanoma skin cancer each year in the United States and many more worldwide. So, you know, this is indicating that there's good evidence that use of indoor tanning beds actually elevates your lifetime risk of developing skin cancer. Um, there was an article that was published. Do I have the article? I don't have the article. I think it's, it's, it might be in the notes at the bottom here. Um, it's looking at tanning bed use in Nova Scotians, and I think this is from around 10 years ago. So as I say, if this has gone out of fashion, then maybe these numbers aren't accurate anymore. But what they found is roughly 23% of people in the 16 to 24 year old age bracket um, used artificial tanning equipment in the previous year. Uh, women were much more likely to choose it than men. And if you're older, you know, 25 to 44, that's the age range that I'm barely still in. 15% um, it drops to, and only 7% if you're 45 or older. So Sarah McDonald, Health Promotion Coordinator for Nova Scotia Division of the Canadian Cancer Society says, the Sun Survey findings for young people are of significant concern. Overexposure to harmful UV radiation from sunlight and tanning equipment puts people at increased risk for skin cancer now as well as in the future. So there you go, that's why you should worry. These are skin cancer rates in the United States going back from the early 70s to like the early 2000s. And what you'll see is for males and females uh, that have 
light colored skin. Um, skin cancer rates have increased from about 8% maybe up to about 25%. So these rates have actually tripled over 30 year range. If you have dark skin, uh, skin cancer rates from sun exposure are very low and have remained very low for the last 30 years. So your actual complexion, how dark your skin is, is a major factor in how likely it is for you to have damage from the sun. So if you have a lot of, of is, it, is it melanin in your skin, I think, if you have dark skin, the melanin is actually sort of like a built-in sunscreen and protects you from this UV light. It doesn't mean you can't get it, it just means your risk is much, much, much lower. It's interesting to see that males have a much higher rate of skin cancer than females. Given the previous slide, we said females were much more likely to use tanning equipment. Um, I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that um, in the United States, for sure, um, men are probably more likely to be in jobs that are mostly outdoors than women, and therefore you'd get a lot more sun exposure just as a result of your occupation. I don't think there's like a gender difference in, uh, you know, it, under the same conditions of one group versus another group getting it. Uh, my observation too <laughs> has been that women typically are better at taking care of their skin and probably more likely to have sunscreens and things like this. Uh, but these all play out. But definitely you can see this big increase. One thing I will say about this though is when you look at cancer rates of skin cancer or really almost any kind of cancer, do you know what the number one risk factor is? for developing cancer? It's your age. Everyone ages, everyone gets old. And the, the idea is, is, is imagine this. What would happen to cancer rates if we cured all infectious disease, if we cured all heart disease, if we cured all of these other things that kill us that aren't cancer, the death rate from cancer would go to 100%. Because eventually, you wouldn't die from all these other things, you just keep getting older, and eventually you're gonna get cancer. So a lot of our diseases, like heart disease, and all these kind of chronic, more chronic diseases, the rates keep going up and up over the last, say, 100 years, but a lot of that is because we've eliminated a lot of other sources of death, right? Like vaccinations, we have vaccinations for almost everything now. Like we got rid of polio, we don't really get malaria, we don't get um, pertussis, and all these other things that we're vaccinated against. Those are people that aren't, didn't die of that, that grew old and got cancer. So the cancer stats just go up over time as we effectively deal with other types. Now one nice thing about cancer too is uh, survival rates after you get cancer are way better now than they were even like 20 years ago. So. All those, all those donations you do and when you do like Relay for Life and things like this, they actually are having a real impact. Like people are actually alive that would not have been um, even 25 years ago. Certain types of cancer like, you know, have been like almost outright cured. The one I, I saw, I think it was like childhood leukemia. Uh, it was a certain type of childhood leukemia but it, survival rate is like almost 100% now. And like 30 years ago, the survival rate was almost 0%. So it's like they developed new treatments which are basically curative in that case. Um, these are cases in Canada going back to 2017, uh, up to 2017 from 88. And they've climbed a little bit, not as dramatically as in the United States, but they've certainly climbed a little bit too. Um, This is mortality based on years of age. And I already kind of mentioned, the older you are, the greater your risk of developing skin cancer. And uh, get old enough, if you're in your like 90s and you get skin cancer, like just remember this class and just think like, you made it. You beat everything else and eventually you got cancer, sure, that's gonna happen to everybody. But like, yeah, you made it if you, if you make it to that point in your life. 
Who knows though? Like we, we still have decades for breakthroughs for you guys. Like 90 might be like a spring chicken in those days. Maybe you go to like 150 or something. I don't know. Um, here's a world map, and it's looking at skin cancer rates across the planet. And it varies quite a bit by country. Notice New Zealand and Australia are very high. Canada is actually relatively kind of low, kind of in the middle-ish low. States are much higher than Canada. Um, and, you know, you kind of have within Europe and, and so on kind of a, a, a varying level. Yes? So the reason why cancer rates are so high, if you think about the facts that we just talked about that increase your risk of developing cancer, one of them is light skin tone, and two, lots of sun exposure. So if you think about Australia, you got both of those. A lot of people with very light skin and a whole lot of sun. In Canada, we have a lot of people with a lot of people with light skin, but we don't have a lot of sun. Yes? So there is some evidence of that too, and probably more likely New Zealand. And we'll talk about that too, because I think I have a map which shows the whole over New Zealand. So there's, there's, there's some likely some impact from there too. Yeah, because it's very south, close to the South Pole. The United States, probably higher than Canada, generally because the United States is sunnier, right? And, uh, but then you have places like right through here, where all the rates are like super low. You know, like, uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of sun in these places. Often it's like quite close to the equator. I guess the equator what, is like down here somewhere? Um, and that's because, you know, if you just look at the countries there, the proportion of people with darker skin versus lighter skin is just gonna play out. So places that where most people have quite dark skin, you just see naturally lower rates of skin cancer because of that natural protection. All right. So in addition to causing skin cancer, another thing that sunlight does is causes aging of the skin. Uh, skin contains a protein called collagen. Collagen is what gives skin its elasticity. And young skin is very elastic, it's supple, it's stretchy, and wrinkle-free. As you age, if you absorb a lot of sunlight, particularly UVA sunlight that comes from the sun, is not blocked at all by the ozone layer, um, your, sun, your skin will age prematurely. It may not impact your, your likelihood of getting cancer, but what it does do is um, make your skin, it'll, it'll break down the collagen in your skin and make it start to look old and wrinkly before it's time. So the solution is sunscreen, of course, right? In my 4,000, I teach a 4,000 level chemistry course, and we actually go into the mechanism of how you get a sunburn from the sun. And it's certain wavelengths of light will be absorbed by your DNA, and it's parts of your DNA chain, I think where you have two thymidine residues that are side by side in the DNA chain, if you have two thymidines, there's a photochemical reaction which is called a two plus two cycloaddition. And what that does is it joins two bases together and um, our bodies have, you know, natural repair mechanisms where they can like cut that piece of DNA out and replace it. But if you get too many of those happen in a short period of time, it'll overwhelm your cell's ability to fix the, the mistake, the error in your DNA and what happens is the cell just dies. It, it's, it commits suicide, essentially. It's called apoptosis. And when that happens uh, to too many cells, that's the sunburn. That's what you're feeling. Okay, so sunscreen. We say wear sunscreen if you're going to spend a lot of time outside, that this is going to protect your sun. And often when you buy sunscreen, it will say right on the container um, what segments of the UV spectrum it blocks against, UVA or UVB or both. Um, they almost never say UVC because UVC isn't really an issue because it doesn't get to the surface of the planet. It also has this thing SPF. And that stands for skin protection factor. So an SPF of 10 means that like 
standing out in the sun for 10 hours would really be like standing out in the sun for one hour with no protection. So basically, you can spend 10 times more time out in the sun. 30, you know, that's, that's like 10 minutes would be like, I don't know, 10 minutes times 30. What is that? Like five hours in the sun. Um, so it basically allows you to spend a lot more time. The higher the SPF, the greater the skin protection factor, the less UV light actually penetrates into your skin. It causes you potential issues. When I was a kid, it was funny. Like this was, I was a kid in the 80s. I was born in 77. So in the 80s, I was a kid. We go to the beach and everything. I never once wore sunscreen as a kid. Like nobody did. It's just nobody thought about it. Like it, nobody realized that getting sunburns was bad or anything like that. You'd get a couple of wicked sunburns at the beginning of each summer, and that was just sort of a rite of passage. And uh, I haven't gotten skin cancer yet, so fingers crossed. But um, definitely I got my share of sunlight over, over the time. I remember when sunscreens first started to come out. And it was like ridiculously low SPF values. It'd be like SPF 3, <laughs> SPF 5, these kinds of things. And I hated having it because it like, I don't know, I wasn't used to it. And you kind of feel all kind of greasy and everything. Um, sunscreens are a lot better now, of course, than they used to be. Uh, but yeah, these do protect you. They have different materials, different ingredients. In the USA, there's 17, so it's probably similar in Canada, different ingredients that are approved. And there's more in the EU, up to 28 in the EU. Canada's usually in step with the US. But these are different ingredients and they have different properties and different uh, things that they can do. So often they contain kind of two types, I would say, of chemicals. One are inorganic chemicals, they're kind of like powders. And examples would be titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. And all these do is absorb UV light and then kind of like reflect it away. So that's sort of their job. It's, it's like a, a barrier. It doesn't uh, really absorb it. It just sort of like reflects it away. Then there's a bunch of different organic chemicals and they absorb the UVB and their job is to absorb the sunlight and then uh, get rid of it. Yeah, someone in the chat says you need to reapply sunscreen every two hours. After two hours, the effects wear, wear off. Um, yeah, and that's, that's highly dependent on your activity. Like if you're swimming, you may have to do it way more often than that, or exercising and sweating and, and so on. Also the types of sunscreen, like, you know how you can get sunscreen and it's like sport? To me, that's like, it's like grease, you know? It's like really, really thick. Like that stuff stays on, but, but yeah. If it's UVA and UVB, there's actually uh, studies that show that titanium dioxide, when exposed to sunlight, can decompose the components that are there to absorb the UVB. So if you're in bright light, it's really a good idea to reapply it more often. These are the actual chemicals. Um, what they all have in common is they are all good at absorbing UV light, uh, and they, their job of these chemicals to absorb light and then do something to get rid of the energy. So it returns to being a molecule that can then absorb more light. And if it does something else, something undesirable, it can actually damage your skin. It can create high energy molecules, which can uh, cause skin damage. It can react, which means it decomposes. It can do all sorts of things. So these are all ones that have been shown to be effective and to be long, long lived. Um, my PhD thesis was actually on molecules that are like these, on sunscreen type molecules and the chemistry that goes on there. So here's an article from realpharmacy.com that says this, according to a June 2014 article, a major study conducted by researchers in Sweden found that women who avoided sunbathing during the summer are twice as likely to die as those who sunbathe every day. So I just wanna say like, just even just the, the writer, whoever it is, I don't see the name there, but um, everybody has a 100% chance of dying, right? So what does that even mean? They're twice as likely to die as those who sunbathe every day. Like without a qualifier there, that doesn't make any sense. Everybody's gonna die, 100% chance. Um, I got interested in this, I read it and it's basically saying that 
Um, staying out of the sun increases your risk of dying from, from cancer. And what they did is this, this cohort study in, in Sweden where they tracked sort of uh, sun habits of, uh, it was a lot of women, um, like thousands I think. I found the actual article that they were referring to, and it was this one, sunscreen use and malignant melanoma. In a new population-based uh, study from Sweden, I guess 571 patients who had a diagnosis of malignant melanoma, 913 controls, so we were over 1,000. Basically what they did is they polled all these winter women, they interviewed them and asked them about their sun habits. Did you wear sunscreen? Did you spend a lot of time sunbathing when you were younger? Did you go to the beach a lot or not very much? Did you go to tanning beds a lot or not very much? And they, they kind of compiled all this data from surveys and was trying to link their actual behavior with, um, with their risk of getting cancer. And one thing they found, uh, which is what this previous article was talking about, uh, was there was an association be between higher sunscreen use was associated with higher risk of developing skin cancer. And this is what this article is here is saying, right? Uh, poorly, but they're saying, this is what they're saying. Um, and it turns out, if you read this actual paper and see what they actually find, it's they substantiate the hypothesis that sunscreen use by permitting more time sunbathing is associated with melanoma occurrence. So essentially what they're saying, and they're also saying that this was mostly for subjects using low SPF, uh, that people would put on low SPF sunscreen and then go out and lay in the sun all day, thinking that that sunscreen that they put on then protected them from any negative side effect of the sun. So by permitting more time sunbathing, that the sunscreen actually put people in danger. And it wasn't the sunscreen caused their cancer, which is what this article is trying to say. It's trying to suggest, oh, don't use sun sunscreen, it causes cancer. That's not what this study shows. It's that people behaved in a different way when they were wearing it. So I guess the, the, the take home message here is either, you know, really um, make sure you are reapplying and you use high SPF, you apply it well, and don't think that just because you put on sunscreen that morning, you're now impervious to the sun, right? You're not, you can still certainly take damage from the sun. Okay, what range of UV light is most damaging to our skin? UVA, UVB, UVC? It's kind of a trick question actually. The one that's most damaging is definitely UVC. But this is risk and hazard. UVC is the biggest hazard. It causes the most damage. But it's lowest risk because none of the UVC from the sun actually reaches us. But just taking the question at face value, the answer is gonna be UVC. Okay. It is. So it's the most damaging to our skin. So the question for those online was, how can it be most damaging for our, to our skin if it doesn't make it through the atmosphere? And you're right, going outside, you're gonna get zero damage from UVC. But there's other sources of UVC that we can, like that, this uh, light meter I have here, this is UVA, but you can get these in UVC as well, right? And actually, um, my research area is photochemistry and we use light boxes, basically it's a box with lights inside, and you can pick what wavelength you want. Um, I was working with a guy who was putting his hand in and out of this all day, and at the end of, his, end of the day, he took his glove off and his hand looked normal, but he had this like really bright red sunburn all down his arm where the glove stopped. <laughs> and he, it was like a really bad sunburn. It was just like seconds and he put it in and out, but it was really intense and it was UVC. So UVC is not something you have to worry about if you're away from a source of UVC light. Um, however, definitely it would cause the greatest damage to your skin for sure. Yeah, pharmacy is spelled with an F, right? Uh, so on this one, and the idea is uh, it's kind of plays into this kind of conspiracy theory that like medicine is bad 
and you should control your health only through um, uh, nutrition and diet. <laughs> I'm not saying nutrition and diet is not important. It definitely is, but um, medicine can help us too in certain situations. Another solution, if you want your skin to look darker, is to use a self-tanning product. And we know Donald Trump is a big fan of this. This is, I think, the original ad for a self-tanning product. And um, I don't know the date of that. I'm guessing the 1960s. And self-tanning products, basically it's a cream or a spray or a mist or something. You apply it to your skin and it actually chemically reacts with your skin and colors it a darker color. All of them, there's all sorts of different brands, they all use the same active ingredient, which is this molecule, dihydroxyacetone. And what dihydroxyacetone does is when it penetrates your skin, it reacts with proteins. And it reacts with proteins and causes them to become darker in color. The exact same reaction happens if you take carbohydrates and react them at a high temperature with proteins. And so that happens in a piece of toast. If you take a piece of toast, it's got proteins in it like gluten and it's got carbohydrates like uh, starches and you heat them in a toaster and this toast turns brown. And that's a reaction called the Malliard reaction and uh, anytime food is cooking and it browns, happens with meat, happens with bread, happens with all sorts of things, that's this reaction between carbohydrates and proteins. Um, so by the way, some, I don't know if anyone here is a baker, but if you're making like rolls, bread rolls, often what people will do is take like a little thing of egg white and like brush the tops of them with egg white before you bake them. What that's doing is it's like giving an injection of protein right there. So it makes them browner because you get more of that protein starch reaction in that case. Um, so this is like a carbohydrate. Actually, is it a carbohydrate? This would be C3H123456O3. Yeah, CH2O times three. This is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are molecules that have a ratio of carbons to waters of one to one. So this goes into your skin, doesn't require high temperatures, but it reacts with the proteins in your skin and darkens your skin using this Malliard reaction. Now the difference between all the different brands is all the extra stuff they put in there. Um, they put stuff in to make it you know, spread better or smell better or dry faster or whatever, but it's all the same active ingredient. Um, sometimes they use this other closely related derivative as well in combination with it, and it makes a slightly different color. Yes? Oh, so yeah, for those who didn't hear that online, um, someone brought up that there's a, a hair product that you put in your hair. I know what you mean, it's like for like highlights. Yeah. You put it in your hair and leave it in and go in the sun and then wash it out after and your hair is lighter on the other side. I honestly don't know how those work. I can think of some ways they could work, but I, I, I wanna look in, I'm interested in that. Yes? Sun in? Oh really? You think like your hair would have grown out? Yes. No, eh? Oh. It's a little unsettling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like when you get chemical exposures that are like long term. I have a colleague who works at um, another university in Nova Scotia, and when she was a graduate student, she spilled a bunch of chemicals on her arm and it absorbed right into like the fat layer under the skin. And she said for years, every time she went outside, she would get these horrible blisters all where it, when, it, when it was exposed to the sun. And she said like for decades, <laughs> and like it's just there and it won't go away. And like she thinks like every year, it may be losing a couple of percent of it, you know? And she said it's been like gradually getting a little bit better. But yeah, no thanks. 
Okay, so DHA, the big one, um, this is a, a derivative of DHA. They just added an extra thing. If you use a combination of these, it might change the color slightly. Sometimes if you use just DHA, people complain it looks too orange. Depends, I think, a bit on your own natural skin tone as well. But these are other products which, um, <laughs> as far as I know, have no real negative health effects long term. And if you're worried about the health effects of these products, I'll say this, they're definitely better than going to a tanning bed in terms of health effects. Yeah. Henna is another similar product. Henna is, of course, um, used in certain cultures. It's like a, an ink that you basically draw on your skin. You can see these designs that are colored on, on this person's hand. And uh, I think that's a camel right there. I'm not sure what's going on in this picture, but uh, this molecule is called lawson, and it's the active molecule that's found in henna, and it's structurally related. And I don't expect you to like really look at these and know everything about these structures, but notice like this part of DHA is the same as this part of this molecule, and so they interact similarly with your body. This one is just a lot darker, right? And I think maybe longer lasting, but both of them will fade over a matter of weeks because your skin is sort of constantly um, regenerating itself. All right. A few more questions. What compound is present in self-tanning products that artificially darkens the skin that ozone, octal salicylate, dihydroxyacetone, uh, or lawson, and the correct one is this one, DHA. Octal salicylate is a common ingredient found in sunscreen. And basically the name of it, salicylate means it comes from salicylic acid, which comes from the bark of certain trees. Um, and then the other part, octal, octal means eight, it's got an eight carbon chain attached to salicylate. And the point of the carbon chain really is to make it like blend into creams nicely. So you can use it as a sunscreen. Um, okay, so this is a really logical place to stop talking and pick up the rest of this chapter next class. I think we have a good, hopefully, understanding of the three different classes of light, wavelengths of light in the UV range that come, their effects on us, what the ozone layer does for us to protect us from them, and how we can protect us from the remainder that gets through using things like sunscreen. All right, so thank you all very much, and I will see everybody Tuesday, I guess. <laughs>